Coming up on this week's Faz TV, we visit Potatoes in Practice near Dundee to hear from key industry professionals about the latest research and development in the Scottish potato sector. Potatoes in Practice is the largest field-based potato event in the UK, bringing growers, scientists, agronomists, machinery dealers and trade organisations together to share knowledge and best practice. Hi, I'm Lucy Mitchell, the Events Manager for Potatoes in Practice. Welcome along. We're here today at Balrogi Farm at the James Hutton Institute and we're here to celebrate and understand the amazing research being done in the industry and also understand the challenges that are facing it. We've got over 60 exhibitors, field plot tours, seminars and live demonstrations. Potato cyst nematodes, PCN, are serious pests in the potato industry. PCN is a parasite that invades root tissues of potato crops which can result in severe yield loss. The main route by which PCN spreads is through the movement of infested material, primarily soil which may be transferred on tubers, plants, waste material or farm machinery. The higher the population of PCN in a field, the greater the risk of spreading it to other land. Scotland is a major seed producing country with growers exporting seed across the world. Land used for growing seed must be free from PCN with strict legislative requirements placed on seed crops. Due to lengthy arable crop rotations, there's a limited land area left in Scotland which is suitable for growing high quality seed potatoes. So I'm, I'm Philip Burgess and I'm uh... Uh, I work for scottishpotatoes.org which is a partnership of, a unique partnership of SIUC, the James Hutton Institute and SASA as well. So I, I work with this those three organisations to coordinate the research and consultancy effort for the potato crop. In this particular case I'm, I'm here to, uh, to talk about PCN Action Scotland which is the knowledge exchange effort that sits behind a major Scottish government initiative to deliver a sustainable potato system in terms of PCN for the future. We've been looking for a number of years now. Uh, in fact, um, I was handed a, a magazine just recently which was uh, produced over 25 years ago talking about an epidemic of, of PCN developing in Scotland, although mostly in England at that time. Um, so we've been talking about the issues for a long time, but now the, the focus really has increased as we have had more land in Scotland become contaminated with uh, PCN, which means that we can't grow seed potatoes in that land any longer. Any land to, to, to produce seed potatoes has to be found to be free of PCN cysts. So as time's gone on, we're losing more and more land to production for seed. And it's, you can take the figures and multiply them up over a number of genera uh, rotations and see that actually if we continue along those sort of lines we won't have a sea potato industry in Scotland left. But all is not lost. Um, we have a, a major Scottish Government initiative uh, producing work uh, to, to look at the research and provide answers to these problems. Uh, seven work packages looking at things ranging from resistance markers, accelerated breeding techniques, uh, issues around tolerance of PCN, use of ground keepers, integrated pest management and the economics of production as well. All areas that have been identified as requiring uh, research to back them up. Integrated into that, uh, that, those work packages right from the very start is a knowledge exchange effort or PCN Action Scotland which aims to take the work coming out of those, um, those work packages and take it directly out to stakeholders so that we're able to really make sure that they, they have the knowledge, the tools and the expertise to be able to take forward the innovations that we're, we're developing. Really, I think there's three key questions that growers need to be asking themselves, or not just growers, but anybody who's involved in potato production. And firstly is, should I be worried about PCN or why should I be worried about PCN? And for different people in, within the supply chain, there are different answers to that question. But in general, basically, we need to be, get on top of the situation for seed growers so they can have land free from contamination and for ware growers because increasingly the, uh, the pesticides that are available to control the problem are not, gonna, not necessarily going to be available in the future. 
Why should I be worried about it? How do I know I have PCN is probably question number two that they should be asking. And this involves growers and uh, taking soil samples throughout their rotation, throughout all their potato growing area to identify fields which have the issue in which PCN is present. And only once you've actually begun to measure the presence of the problem can you start to put the tools in to, uh, to control it. It's not just as simple as understanding whether you've got the problem, you need to understand what species you have as well. And this leads into, once you know the species you've got, you can then start to choose varieties in particular which match the, res the correct resistance to those species. So it's, it's relatively complicated, but the, the knowledge and, and exchange that's going on through this programme should help growers to understand those, those things. And the third question really is, are there any varieties that I can use to help reduce my problem? And the answer to that is uh, increasingly yes. Uh, and we've got here a demonstration of eight different varieties which are showing good levels of resistance to the pallida form of PCN, uh, Glob Globadera pallida, uh, rather than Globadera rostockiensis. Um, and we can go through those varieties and show the, uh, the, the, the benefits of using resistance. Okay, well we've got eight varieties here on, on show which have some level of resistance to uh, the pallida form of, of, of PCN. But I'm just going to concentrate and, and show you three in particular. So uh, we, have, we have Panther, Marvel, Lenorma and Innovator. And Innovator is a really interesting variety. It's highly resistant to PCN. To, to the level where if you grow it in a field which has uh, PCN cysts present, uh, it very probably has fewer cysts after the crop has been grown than were there before. Whereas another variety which is susceptible, such as Maris Piper, might multiply the number of cysts by many times, 10, 20 times levels, uh, which then take a long time to decline in the field. One issue is that it is a single gene resistance, which does mean that over time it is possible that the, uh, the nematodes might be able to overcome that resistance. And we know that from uh, resistance to other pesticides, sort of pesticides and other varieties and things as well. But actually for PCN, because it multiplies over, um, you know, once every rotation, actually the number of cycles that happen does mean that it is relatively unlikely. And I think for the moment we can be pretty confident that, that a variety like Innovator will continue to provide us with high levels of resistance. But from a Scottish perspective, uh, a lot of seed of Innovator is grown, but as a wear crop, it's not particularly useful. Uh, it's a processing variety. It's used worldwide by McCain's and, and other processors to, to pro good, uh, good, produce good fries. Um, but we don't really have the market in Scotland for, uh, for processing potatoes. Uh, we're more looking for something rather that can be a pre-packed variety. And if you just look at Innovator here, you'll see it's got a very rough skin on it. It's really not the sort of variety that you would want washed in a, in a pre-pack and available in a supermarket. So if we just move, move on to uh, the next variety is Eurostar. Eurostar has the same level of genetic resistance um, and it, uh, it has been used. It has been used by... Uh, uh, by some growers in Scotland as a pre-packed variety and it does have a, a much nicer clearer skin finish on it as you can see there but it, it, it is still really a processing variety it's slightly higher dry matter and you can't you can see here that it's a fairly long potato um, but actually it could possibly be a little bit longer if, if this crop had had more white water it might have ended up being a bit longer which isn't the sort of shape that we particularly want for a supermarket so it has been used in some supermarkets in some situations, but I think it's really more sort of downgraded, more to perhaps a, a value pack these days. Um, uh, but, but it is really interesting and has been grown and does have the same sort of resistance characteristics of Innovator. I, I believe it's bred from it and has the same genetics behind it. But, uh, if we just move along, um, Elland is a, is a, is a, it's a, it's a particularly interesting variety. Um, I think you'll find Elland on, um, on other plots around potatoes in practice as well. Uh, bred by Signet uh, locally in Scotland. And it, um, it does, we, we haven't had a great deal of, um, 
of experience with it as a variety, but it does seem to be producing uh, really quite nice looking potatoes. Uh, and I do understand that uh, at least one supermarket or packer is, is taking this one further forward. And I hope that we can begin to see this. This is a fully resistant variety uh, to Pallida um, and it could have really interesting uh, potential for the future. Um, it does, in this particular sample, possibly it's suffered a little bit from the drought and hasn't produced particularly large potatoes, but there's things we can do about that uh, with irrigation and whatever in other sites. And I could, I think I might have said we would look at three, but I'd actually quite like to look at the fourth as well, if we've got time on the thing. So this is Buster. This is a variety from IPM. There's not a huge amount of this grown in Scotland, but I understand a few ware growers are looking at it um, as a potential uh, for the future, uh, really just testing it out. And I think from, you know, from our look-see here, it's, it's looking as if it does have potential. This one's quite interesting because it actually uses a different form of resistance. So uh, it's actually got stacked resistance in it. It's got more than one gene in there, which does pr presume mean that it's more likely to be uh, uh, resilient into the future as well. So that's a really interesting variety and perhaps shows where we're moving to with uh, new breeding and new varieties in the future. And I think that really shows that, that for growers in Scotland that there are, uh, there are options out there being developed for uh, handling the PCM problem. And these are just a few of the varieties that are coming through the system and commercially available now. But if you go around this site at Potatoes in Practice, there's a lot of other breeders here and they are all looking for varieties with resistance to uh, potato cyst nematode. Hi, my name's John Jones. I'm a plant nematologist, plant pathologist who works at the James Hutton Institute. I'm also the head of the Cell and Molecular Sciences Department there. We're here today at Potatoes in Practice to talk about resistance to potato cyst nematodes. Uh, PCN, potato cyst nematodes, it's a problem uh, in many fields in Scotland. It's a particular problem on seed land. Uh, we are convinced at the Institute that the way to control PCN is natural resistance and I guess the, the points we're making here today is we're showing the results of some field trials that demonstrate first of all that, that resistance to PCN really, really works well in terms of suppressing the nematode populations. And the other key point is, is the, the fact that resistance is now available in quite a wide range of cultivars. There's always been a perception in the past that there is a limited range of cultivars with resistance to Globodera pallida that are available but now there are far more cultivars. You can see in the plot behind me here, these are some trials from the James Hutton Limited of lines that contain PCN resistance. And we've got some results that we're showing today that show there's a whole range of potato lines with PCN, Globodera powder resistance that work really well in the fields. We've also been talking to people about the difference between resistance and tolerance. So a resistant plant suppresses nematode numbers, it controls the pathogen. A tolerant plant doesn't provide any control of the nematode, but what it does is it protects the yield. Now on the one hand that's good because it means you're getting a good yield from your crop, but the problem with a tolerant line is if it's in a susceptible potato, then it allows a buildup of a huge number of nematodes in the field. So we've been talking about the difference between resistance and tolerance and the benefits of using resistant uh, varieties in the field. So my name is Leslie Torrance. I'm the Director of Science at the James Hutton Institute here in Invergowrie, Dundee. And um, I'm responsible for uh, managing and monitoring the quality of science and the direction of science at the Institute. Um, and uh, I have principal uh, uh, role around crop science. And my background actually is in um, plant virology and plant pathology. So we're starting a campaign to raise capital funding for uh, something called the International Potato Innovation Centre. And this is a, a whole sector model where we want to bring industry research providers ourselves together to help to solve problems uh, in, the, in the potato sector. Potatoes are, are facing a huge challenge in terms of climate change um, as well as um, uh, having to uh, develop sustainable production systems to protect biodiversity and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And, um, we think that this is a, a timely um, uh, development because um, there's been some major breakthroughs in technology. So in breeding technology, um, there's been huge advances that will allow us to develop potato varieties more quickly within, say, five years. 
and there's also been advances in things like um, machine learning and AI and drones and sensors to allow us to model disease incidents and precisely target interventions such as agrochemical applications or nutrient use. So we think that this sector is based on a sort of a, this center is based on a whole sector model where we're bringing all the players together to discuss, co-construct and, and develop uh, research plans to solve those problems and to pull the uh, research out and the innovations out into the field. At the uh, James Hutton Institute we have um, something called the Commonwealth Potato Collection which is a big collection of uh, potato accessions, something like 1500 accessions and they were obtained from the region of potato, the origin of potato which is in the Andean region of South America and uh, the, these are material that's grown in very many different agro-environments from the arid desert areas through to warm areas through to high highland high altitude areas and we want to mine uh, that uh, collection to look for traits that are important. So for example this project here uh, was funded by the UK Global Challenges Research Fund to allow us to exploit the variation in, in, the, in the CPC. Um, and you can see this population, there are five uh, lines here. This is the product of about five years of research and trials in Malawi and in Kenya. It performs very well in hot climates. Um, it matures very quickly in 70 days rather than the normal 100, 120 days of, of uh, the potatoes that we're used to, such as these ones over there. So five of these have been approved for release in Malawi and they're undergoing trials in Kenya too. And we expect these to be a game changer in both of those countries in terms of increasing yields. At the moment in Kenya and Malawi, the yields are very low for potatoes, something like eight to 10 tonnes per hectare. And they also tend to grow varieties such as the ones that have been developed for northern countries. So that's varieties that grow well in one growing season and then they stay dormant for a long time and then we plant them again. In, in sub-Saharan African countries they want early maturing and they want fast sprouting so that they can grow two or three crops a year. And so um, in Kenya for example there's 800,000 potato farmers who predominantly grow one variety of potato and access to this material will give them huge um, uh, advantage in terms of more variety, better quality and um, higher yields. Um, it's been estimated that if you just increase the yield of potato of half of less than half, 40% of the farmers um, by half, uh, we increase the Kenyan GDP by something like 0.3%, which doesn't sound a lot, but it's billions of, of pounds. My name's Graham Mackey. I'm a seed potato producer from Turriff in Aberdeenshire. We grow 80 hectares of various varieties, uh, from export to varieties for the home market, main crops and salads to be produced on. I'm part of the Seed Potato Organisation's steering group, a group of nine growers along with uh, some technical advisors, helpers, to try and get uh, an organisation off the ground to help and represent us as seed growers. Our main key objectives is to represent representation of our industry, which is hugely important in this uh, current climate, pinpointing the, the most significant research and development programmes to go forward with to help the industry. Also to help support and develop the markets uh, as they are and any potential markets going forward and just the overall sustainability of our industry. If you would like to find out more about the Seed Potato Organisation or new developments in the Scottish potato sector, visit www.scottishpotatoes.org. Hi, I'm Ian McCormick. I'm one of the vets here at SRUC. I work as a veterinary investigation officer here at St Boswell's. I drove into work this morning, the combines were rolling already at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's an incredibly hot period of time of year um, and everybody's very busy. However, we have been busy here at our post-mortem facility and some of the cases we've seen recently have been sudden deaths due to lungworm. So lungworm's still out there, um, still a problem every year um, and it has a very interesting life cycle which um, 
uh, it's very different to gut worms, which is some of the challenges I think we have with lung worm, is that the two things are very different and therefore we have to uh, have strategies that, uh, that allow you to uh, treat both conditions. Um, so it has an interesting life cycle. The uh, infective stages are the larvae, the L3 larvae that climb up the, the grass, the herbage and get eaten by uh, the, the cattle. Um, as once it's ingested, it gets absorbed through the small intestine and into the lymph system. And then from the lymph system, it goes around to the lungs. And it takes up to 15 days from first ingestion of the larvae before it gets to the lung um, and develops into an adult worm. And really it's when the adult worms are migrating up the, the airways that you start to see coughing and some respiratory distresses, which is often what um, farmers see um, or hear in their uh, herds that are outside grazing. And this might alert you to being a problem. Um, once the larvae um, have uh, been ingested, as I said, there's this gap between them producing the larvae and their own feces, um, um, which we use as a form of diagnosis. Um, and so there is a gap between probably 15 days and about 25 days, a gap of about 10 days where we, are, where we have this, what we call a diagnostic gap. There's a, a, a challenging period of time, um, but we can't actually diagnose the problem yet we're seeing the clinical signs. Of course, in respiratory disease, it could, it could be anything other than it could be other things in lungworm. So we, we quite often find that there's uh, co-infections, um, often, um, if you have lungworm, it might also have uh, IBR um, or any other viral or bacterial cause of pneumonia. So um, just remain open-minded um, that it's not always just lungworm and lungworm alone. Um, the adult uh, lungworm, uh, they produce um, thousands of eggs per day, um, which really, um, you know, each um, female can produce up to six, 7,000 eggs a day, which really uh, makes the pasture contamination very high very quickly. Um, those uh, those eggs are coughed up and um, they contain the larvae um, which has food source itself so it can survive in the faeces and therefore it's passed out onto the pasture and in warm weather like this they will then hatch to become the L3, the infective stage on the herbage with, probably within a week. So it's uh, a very quick life cycle. Um, certainly if the weather rains um, and the faecal pats um, get uh, um, dissolved slightly, that will increase the, the infectivity across the pasture and you see more problems. Um, so the immunity is uh, very important with lungworm. Um, there's two types of immunity in cattle. One is immunity to the, uh, uh, the larvae that come in and also the second is the immunity to the adult worms. Um, the adult worm immunity generally lasts longer, probably up to a couple of years, whereas the immunity to the larvae lasts less long, probably in a matter of months, three to four months. So unfortunately sometimes cattle will have um, will need to be um, exposed to keep that immunity up. Um, this is where vaccination can be very useful, but even with vaccines, um, the lungworm vaccine, you have to allow the um, uh, cattle to be exposed to the low levels of infection on the pastures. So therefore using long-acting long long anthelmintics at the same time as using the vaccine is a no-no. Um, that'll just negate the um, benefits of using the vaccine. Thanks very much for watching and join us again next week.